morning again, church. Good morning. It is a blessed day to be in the house of the Lord today. Last week, we began our journey into chapter 4 of Revelation by looking at heaven. We took kind of a deep dive into heaven. We looked at the scriptures to describe what's heaven like. A lot of people wonder, what is heaven going to be like? And so we looked at what the scriptures had to say about heaven. So let's go ahead and open your Bible and find Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. If you don't have your Bible with you today, there should be one in the pew in front of you. Uh, Revelation, the last book in the New Testament and the last book of Scripture. So Revelation chapter 4. Amen when you're there. Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 4. John writes, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Now, as I mentioned in the closing of last week's sermon, as we kind of did uh, that look at heaven, and we briefly touched on chapter 4, verse 1, there's actually a lot to see and unpack in this little bitty verse. And so this morning, uh, we want to give the proper honor and respect to this scripture portion. And with help from the Holy Spirit, I pray that he will teach us and guide us into this heavenly territory. Uh, also, as we walk cautiously through God's word, as always, I encourage you to leave behind any kind of uh, baggage of preconceived thoughts of what you think heaven might be like or, or, or what, as we read what things might be like, any kind of ideas, any images that you have from uh, books or movies or TV shows. And let's just let the text speak for itself. Amen? I'm just going to let the text speak for itself. And in other words, let's be good Bereans. If you remember in Acts chapter 17, every time Paul would preach or speak to the Berean people, they would go back and search the scriptures to see if what Paul was saying was true. So we want to be good Bereans as well and offer a thorough examination of the scriptures. And so with that starting point in mind, let's go ahead and look back again at verse number 1. Right at the beginning, look what John writes. He says, after these things. And so when we read that, we have to stop and ask the question, after what things? What's John talking about? What's he referring to? Well, this verse actually is reflecting back to chapter 1. So hold your place in chapter 4, and let's look at Revelation chapter 1, specifically verse number 19. And uh, it's in red, so this is Jesus speaking in chapter 1, verse 19. And Jesus is saying this to John. He says, Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. Now again, if you remember back to our study when we were in chapter 1, we saw that verse 1, 19, actually what it does is it, it divides up the entire book of Revelation into three different sections. The first section is the things which you have seen. Now that's written in past tense. It's said in past tense. And, chapter, and that covers all of chapter 1 of Revelation, things which you have seen. John was given a vision of the glorified Christ in all of his glory and all of his majesty. Matter of fact, if you remember, in chapter 1 when he sees Jesus in this glorified state, what happens to him? He says he falls down as if he is a dead man. Now, this is the same John who, if you remember at the Last Supper, laid his head on the chest of Jesus. They were very close Friends, and at the crucifixion, as Jesus is on the cross, he looks down. There's Mary and John beside him, and he says, Look, mother, see your son, and son, see your mother. So they were very close. But now, John has this vision of Jesus glorified. He sees him as God, and so he falls down as if he's a dead man, and Christ has to stand him back up. And so that's what the things which you have seen, he sees his vision Jesus is in all of his glory and all of his majesty. Jesus is seen as the holy and the sovereign king. He is the risen and alive God and Savior. And John, again, in chapter 1, sees Jesus in the midst of his church. Remember, he sees Jesus amongst the seven lampstands. And Jesus reveals these seven lampstands are the seven churches. But then he continues, he says, the things which are. Now, this is present tense, so he can say the things which are now, and that covers chapter 2 and 3, because in chapters 2 and 3, we just finished those, we find Jesus speaking directly to the seven churches of Asia Minor, which would be modern-day Turkey, 
And in these letters, Christ, he has a pattern for how he speaks to the church. First, he offers a commendation where it's due, the things they've done well. And then he offers a rebuke if it is needed for the church. Because remember, there's two churches out of seven. They didn't need a rebuke. They were doing exactly what they were supposed to do. And then lastly, he gives them a call to action. So in each letter, Jesus basically he says this. Number one, be encouraged by his presence. Each letter says that. Be encouraged by his presence. In other words, he wants them to know, I'm with you. And not only am I with you, but I know your works. He says he is intimately familiar not only with the church, but with every single soul that is sitting in that church. He knows exactly what they're thinking, exactly what they're doing. So he says, be encouraged. He knows them. The second thing he says is to repent and turn away from sin. If there is sin in that church, he says, turn back to Christ. Abandon the things that you are doing that are wrong. And in the last thing he says, he says, know that he will reward those who hear what he's saying, respond to what he's saying, and then obey his commands. And he says that these are those who will overcome trials. They will overcome tribulations, and they will ultimately overcome persecutions. And that's kind of how each letter is broken up. And then lastly, he closes all of his letters with an exhortation. He says to pay attention. Listen to what the Spirit says. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, Jesus is saying, listen, don't just listen, but really and truly hear what the Spirit is saying to the people. Church, did you know that God doesn't just speak to speak? He doesn't just speak to speak. He wants his people to hear. He wants his people to be obedient and to actually do the things that he commands us to do. And even though in chapters 2 and 3, we remember in context, these letters were written to specific people in specific churches at a specific time for specific reasons. That's keeping it in context. However, these letters are still applicable. They're applicable to all churches in all of time. In other words, from the time the church was created in the book of Acts all the way till now, you can find churches like these scattered throughout history, and you can find churches like these today. We are actually talking about that last night. A lot of the churches, I think, nowadays fall into the Laodicean category. Churches made up of unbelievers. But I, I'll digress. The third thing, he, uh, Jesus says, the things which will take place after this. So now we're dealing with future tense. These are things after the vision of the glorified Christ, the things which you have seen, after the letters to the churches, the things which are going on right now. Now that leads us, it's a, it's a natural leap into chapter Four, and we begin the final division of the book of Revelation, which will take us from chapter 4 all the way to chapter 22. In this next section, we move from what's called the church age into the time of the end. It'll be the end of the world, and it'll be the end of history as we know it. So now, let's turn back to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. He writes, after these things, I, this is John speaking, I, John, looked, and behold, what does he see? A door standing open in heaven. Now let's stop there. Church, do you understand the magnitude of that observation? Just that what he sees. Do you understand the magnitude of that? I mean, for a believer, for a born-again believer, did you know that the door to heaven is open to you? That door is not closed. That door is open to you. Jesus said as much back in chapter 3, verse 8. He was talking to the faithful church of Philadelphia. He said, I know your works. He says, see, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. He says, for, if you, for you have a little strength, yet you've kept my word, and you have not denied my name. Now, as we studied in, in that letter to Philadelphia, it's actually it's a dual meaning that Jesus is talking about. There was an open door. There was an open door to share the gospel with those around them. That door is open, but it's also an open door to the entrance to heaven. And as we'll see as we progress through chapter 4 and into the, the rest of Revelation, we're going to see that this open door leads to the very throne room of God Almighty. But John continues. He says, And the first voice which I heard, now that's important to remember because first voice means that throughout this book, John is going to hear different voices. Angels will be speaking to him. Jesus is going to be speaking to him. But the first voice that he hears is this voice. 
He says, the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me. So that begs the question, who is this voice that, that sounds like a trumpet? Well, I'm glad you asked. Look back at chapter 1, verses 10 to 11, and we find out right away. So in verse chapter 1, verse 10, John writes, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. So, who is this voice? It's Jesus. Jesus is this first voice. But here's the question now. Why does John equate Christ's voice to a trumpet? Glad you asked that as well. We've asked Jonah to bring his trumpet today. Jonah, can you just play us a couple of notes? Loud notes, if you will. Alright, thank you. Right now, when you hear that, what came to mind when you hear a trumpet? So if you were kind of nodding off or you were in prayer, that might have woken you up just then, right? I mean, you think about it, what comes to mind? It was loud, right? Probably especially for Philip sitting there, but it was loud, <laughs> right? So, and it's crisp. I mean, you can hear the notes. He did a really good job. So it was loud, it was crisp. It gets your attention again. It wakes you up. It draws your eyes to it. If you were just sitting here and you didn't know he was going to do that, guaranteed, the moment he hit that first note, your eyes would turn right to him. You go, what's that? So maybe the, maybe the voice was commanding like that. I mean, when you hear a trumpet play, you kind of stand up a little bit taller, especially those that are in the military and you hear the trumpet. You, you kind of stand a little taller. Maybe it's authoritative. So you hear that when you think of kings or presidents or, or dignitaries coming down. And so all these words come to your mind. And so John hears this voice, which is like a trumpet. And what, look at what the voice says. It says, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. What an amazing gift. What an amazing gift for that to be said to John. But it wasn't just an amazing gift. It was also a heavy burden. A heavy burden. Now I say, again, amazing gift because as we'll see, John is literally transported from our earthly plane of existence up into the heavenly realm, to the third heaven as we looked at. He's beyond the sky, he's beyond outer space. He is actually in the third realm, this, this realm of eternity now. He is in the presence of Jesus Christ. He's taken from here to there. The curtain between our reality and the spirit realm is pulled back and John is allowed to see and hear things that are going to happen in the future. Because remember, John can see this because Jesus is the great I am. He is Yahweh. He's not the I was or the I will be. He's the I am. God can flip through time the way you and I can flip through the pages of a book. Time has no bearing on God. And so he can show him things that are going to take place in the future, and he does just that. John is allowed to see and to hear things that are going to happen. <coughs> that's also why I say that's a heavy burden. It's a heavy burden because once he's seen all that Christ wants him to see, now he has the burden to tell others. He has the burden now to warn others of the things that's about to happen, things that's about to come upon the earth. And church, once you have seen and understood the truth that's been revealed to us in God's word, you also have a responsibility. You also have a divine burden, if you will, to share what you know. We don't just come to learn more about God and just keep it to ourselves. We're to come, we get equipped to do the ministry of the church, to go out into the world, to proclaim the things that we know are true because God's word cannot lie, amen? And so even though John had a physical revelation and he could see it, you and I have something even better. We have the complete revelation from beginning to end. So therefore we have a burden as well. We have the same responsibility. But I want to focus on the phrase right now, things which must take place after this. After this. You know, I mentioned before that there are two main theological positions that you can take regarding uh, Jesus' words right here. The after this. Technically there's three and an unwritten fourth that we'll talk about. But the first is called a premillennial view. And we talked about this a little bit at, when we got into Revelation originally, but... In a, pre a premillennial view, they view event, the premillennial view views events that we're about to read 
are in the future, and it's a faraway future for John. Uh, it's after the church age. In other words, uh, as a matter of fact, many in the premillennial camp hold to the, the rapture theology. Hold to the rapture theology. In other words, you see that as Jesus is saying that thing, the things that John is about to witness is after the church and the Holy Spirit have been removed from the world. And basically the world is just turned over to itself to do whatever the world wants to do. And it'll be a horrific time when that happens. All these events are supposed to happen prior to Christ's return when he will set up a literal 1,000-year reign here on earth. And that's why it's called a pre-millennial view. The church and the Holy Spirit's removed, and all this is going to happen before Christ comes back for his 1,000-year reign. Second uh, view is called a post-millennial view. Now, those that hold this view, they see the rest of Revelation as a what's called a near prophecy. In other words, these events are about to take place shortly in the time that John is here. So a premillennial view of Revelation uh, sees Revelation as being written at a later date, around 95 AD. Uh, this would be about during the time of Emperor Domitian. And it also takes place after the fall of Jerusalem and after the temple has been destroyed. That is the premillennial view. The postmillennial view, though, however, sees the rest of Revelation that we're going to read to have been written a lot earlier, around 70 AD, during the time of Nero. And they talk about, uh, believe that the Antichrist that is talked about in here is actually Nero, and that they believe this takes place before the fall of Jerusalem and the, and the destruction of the temple. The uh, postmillennial view also sees the 1,000-year reign, reign of Christ as not literal. That's where you go back to what Peter said. A thousand years is a day, and a day is a thousand years. So if you hold a post-millennial view, uh, you don't believe that it's a literal 1,000-year reign. As a matter of fact, uh, the post-millennial sees the, the, that reign to have started at the beginning of the church. So in Acts, that's whenever the millennial age began because, it, again, they see it as not a literal 1,000 years. And the post-millennialist believes that Jesus is going to return one day, yes, but they say he's not going to return until after the world has come to Christ through evangelism and the spread of the gospel. And most all the events, again, have already taken place. So as you read Revelation, they see it as happening during the time of Nero. I mentioned there's a third option. It's called the amillennial view. The amillennial view sees Revelation 4 to 22 as strictly allegorical. Uh, most theologians, though, don't hold an amillennial view, and for the most part, it's really been disregarded in a lot of theological circles. And as such, we're going to focus on the first two views, uh, scriptural and historical evidence for both these views. And as we do so, please, please remember that neither view can be proved with 100% accuracy. We can't say 100% either one is true. Neither of you is to be seen as heretical. So if you have a friend who is post-millennial and you're pre-millennial or vice versa, don't see them as the enemy. You know, that's not part of how you can be saved. You have to, you know, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, and believe this about the end times. That's not part of how you can be saved. So neither of you is to be seen as heretical. Great minds from both camps of pre- and post-millennial have debated for centuries about this issue. But that leads us into the question. The study of end times is called eschatology. And so we have to ask the question, why do it? Why study end times theology? Why are we doing that? Why does it matter? How does it even apply to our lives as Christians today? And that's a really good question. I mean, if these are future events, why should we study eschatology? Well, I'd say this. First of all, I believe it's important because Scripture deals with it. Scripture deals with it. The Scripture is going to detail about things that are going to happen. And since Scripture talks about the end times, so should we. I mean, after all, 2 Timothy, didn't, didn't Paul write and say all Scripture is given by inspiration? That all Scripture is profitable? He said that. And so since it was important enough to write down, we too should read and we should study. As I also mentioned earlier on in our study of Revelation, God does not want us to be ignorant of things that are going to happen. God does not want us to be caught unaware. He does not want us to be unprepared. You know, Scripture says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but He's given us a spirit of what? Of power and of love and of sound mind. And so with that, we gain knowledge. And church, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. Knowledge gives us wisdom in how to live our lives for the glory of Christ. Knowledge gives us hope and confidence. 
When we read God's Word and we use God's Word as a lens to view our culture and view our world, we can sit back and go, yeah, that makes sense. I can see why the world is like it is. The Bible over 2,000 plus years ago has told us that things are going to grow darker and darker and get more evil and more perverse as the end draws near. I don't know about you, but that's what I think we're seeing nowadays. This is why I, I don't really fall into a post-millennial camp. Again, they believe that the world is going to become more Christian with the spread of the gospel. But what do we actually see happening in our world? We don't see that happening, do we? I mean, think back as far as you can in your life. Think back as far as you can and ask the question, is the world getting better today? What would you say? No. No. You know, my 49 going on 50 short years, this world has changed 180. I mean, it really has. So you have to ask the question, is the world getting better? Is the world growing more holy? What would you say? Definitely not. Uh, I would say, is the world coming more or less Christian? Would you say it's becoming more Christian? Less. Less. Absolutely. I would say that from simple observation, it's not getting better. The world is actually becoming more wicked, more perverse, and definitely more hostile to Christ than the Christians. If you don't believe me about that, come out with us on the streets. You'll just have people completely ignore you or no. I mean, they've been pretty nice so far on the sunset, but you, know, you never know. And so studying, though, eschatology is important. It's important whether the prophecies and revelation are relatively close, whether it is a post-millennial view, or if they're in the distant future, which is the pre-millennial view. But either way, it is important because how we view the end times should and will directly impact how we see and navigate this world how you have a sense of urgency to get out and share the gospel with people. John was given this amazing revelation. He, gave, he had an amazing revelation of Jesus Christ and all of his glory. Then he's given this incredible vision of future events that are going to take place. He was actually commissioned by God himself to record all that he sees, all that he hears, so that future generations of believers will know what will happen so we can prepare. He doesn't want us to say, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. I would have gotten ready. No, he says, listen, this is going to happen. You need to be ready. And you need to get your family ready. You need to get out and... Share the gospel with as many souls as you can. And again, for John, he looked and he saw a door standing open in heaven. For you and I, as born-again believers, that door is still standing open for us today. But you know what? There's good news. Good news that that door is open for any and all who would repent and believe. That door today is standing open for them as well. For those who are truly broken and sorry for their sins, those who would confess Jesus Christ as Lord, for them, that door to forgiveness and salvation stands open today. But friends, one day, and we don't know when that day will be, that door will close. Did you know that? It'll close. And once it's closed, it will not be opened again. That'll be it. Today, the door is open. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. We don't know about tomorrow. We don't know about the next day. And if we're honest, we don't know about tonight. We don't know about an hour or a few minutes from now. We don't know. We can hear another trumpet blast. And we look over at Jonah and he's like, what me? And then all of a sudden we're called up. So today, this day, that door is open for you. And friends, I would say this, whether you're here with us today or you're watching on YouTube later on, if you're not right with the Lord, if you've only been pretending, if you've only been playing church, if you've been playing the part of the hypocrite, if you don't know that you were born again in the Spirit, don't wait. Make your election sure today. Do it today. What are you waiting for? Church, we're going to explore a lot of eschatology <laughs> over the next few weeks. We're going to be studying a lot of end times because that's what the book of Revelation is about. We're going to look at Premillennial rapture theology. We're going to look at all the scripture that, that, that supports that. 
We're also going to look at the post-millennial theology and all the scripture that supports that. Because remember I said there's great minds in both camps that debate this issue. And what I don't want to do is I don't want to tell you what to think. I don't want to tell you what to think. I want you to examine the evidence, examine the scriptures, and come to your own conclusion based off of scriptural testimony. That's what you should do. You never want to say, well, why do you believe that? Well, because my pastor believes that. Okay, well, what does the Word of God say? That's what you should believe. And so I do have my own thoughts. I do have my own thoughts on it. I do have a certain position. I talked a little bit about it uh, back in Revelation chapter 1 when we were doing a big overview of it. And I will talk about that again as we dig deeper. But again, John was given this amazing vision, and you and I have been given something so much better. We have the complete revelation of God's Word. We know what the beginning was like. We know why we're here, and we know where we're going. We know what the end is going to be. And so that we can know for sure what God has shown and what God has said. He had it written down. Next week, Lord willing, we'll look at the, those two main eschatological positions in death. We'll premillennial rapture theology and postmillennial theology. We'll, we'll look at the scriptures for all that. And as we meditate and we ponder on Christ's words to the apostle, where he heard Christ say, Come up here, I'll show you things which must take place after this. Remember again that this door is open to you today. It is open to you today. It's open for salvation for the lost. And that door is open to the church to go out and proclaim the message of the gospel. But again, remember this, that one day that door to both is going to close forever. Have you thought about that? There will come a day that not only there will be people that door to salvation will close because God's wrath will come. Because right now that lifeline is open. But also the door is going to close where we won't be able to go out and share the gospel anymore. I mean, now we have this opportunity. The door is open to us for the world, for us to go into the entire world. You know, it's kind of sad in a way that we're not going to be able to go out and share the gospel. But it's also kind of joyous because we're not going to need to. Because we're going to be with Him. Again, for the believer, the door of opportunity to go share the gospel with the lost will come to a close because God is either going to call us home or He's going to come and meet us here. Either way, though, right now, that door is open. So won't you enter in? Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the time together that you've given us today. Your word is powerful, Lord. Your word not only does it inspire us, Lord, but it strengthens us. It comforts us. It brings hope to the hopeless. It brings joy to those that don't have joy. But Lord, your word testifies of exactly who you are. Your word is life. Lord Jesus, you said it is the bread of life. And as believers, help us to feed on your word every day that we may receive spiritual nourishment that we need to strengthen us, to embolden us, to give us courage to go and be obedient to your commands and do the things which you have commanded us to do. And for those, again, Lord, that do not know you as Lord and Savior and you do not know them as one of your children today, Lord, we pray that your word would convict hearts. That the people that you died for would seriously think and consider on their own mortality and eternity. Because, Lord Jesus, you are coming back. And today that door of salvation and the door of opportunity is open. But again, Lord, we know that one day that Lord will close. So give us a sense of urgency. Convict our hearts and minds. If we've been slothful or we've been neglecting to be obedient to your commands and to your word. We thank you for the forgiveness that you offer and the grace and the mercy that you offer. We ask all of this in the mighty name of our risen Lord, the Lord Jesus.